Sorry, Riffs. This is a wonderful theory. Last time you posited all of the uh, crazily irresponsible fan theories while I fanced the flames and egged you on as hard as I could. So, okay, I got one of my own. All right, let's hear it. The TV show never did a direct adaptation of anything later than number 17. There's elements that you see in later episodes, but they never did a full book. And you already did a really good job talking about how and why they should have done the departure. So, Hmm. the anvil hanging over everyone's head. How would this series have done the David trilogy? And last time when I spent entirely too long talking about changes... I added this, and then in the text for the video, basically recanted, saying I regretted it. I said they might have taken an element from book 20. And then I realized, I think they laid the groundwork if it hadn't been canceled. Something that's significant. Any character that has a first and last name should be important. And notably in the Animorphs, our protagonists (laughs) never get last names. The only ones we have in the TV show is Melissa Chapman, who's a direct adaptation. And the only other character we ever meet who appears to be poised to make a difference, who gets a first and last name, is Harold freaking Nesbitt. Yes. My fan theory is that he prefers to go by his middle name, Harold David Nesbitt. And they've already set this up. He's got a creepy relationship with Rachel. Uh, it hasn't been fully explored, but he's established a rivalry with Marco. He films Marco morphing and it sets off this crisis that culminates in Marco staging a home invasion to steal his property. This is the mission in book 20 when he's trying to get back the Escafil device. And then I even thought of a way that they could transition into this to do it for real. They established that Harold David Nesbitt is an amateur movie maker and he's making these cheesy sci-fis. He thinks he's going to have his footage aired on television, but it's averted, uh, unbeknownst to him, by some bizarre combination of Axe blowing the power grid and Jake and Rachel failing to break a VCR. So all he knows at the end of this is he had golden footage and got screwed, and it's established that he goes to school with them, so he's watched this footage of Marco morphing again and again. It's only a matter of time right. until he like, actually notices Marco at school and goes, <laughs> wait, hold up. So here's how I'm imagining this episode is going to start. We're back at the plant. It's not a construction site. It's a plant. Right. We're back there. It's sunset. Harold Nesbitt is messing around with his camera filming, like, you know, B-roll footage for his darker, more artistic, serious movie because now he's the tortured artist. And he's doing some close-ups on some rats running through the rubble. That's how it starts. (laughs) And he finds the GD Escafil device. And he's like, I'm going to show Rachel. And while he's trying to get her attention or whatever, he's in the hallway. And hell, they could even do another version of that Tobias Jake shot from (laughs) Not My Problem. Just imagine it. The crowd down the hallway, Harold holding out the Escafil device the same way comic book Marco's holding the comic book and the meme that I've got to track down to make this (laughs) reference make sense. And at the other end of the hallway, Marco. Marco sees the Escafil device. Harold sees and recognizes Marco. And the drama goes from there. And Marco makes it a big point that he remembers his name now because it's an ongoing gag that everybody forgets his name. Guys, it's Harold Nesbitt. Guys, it's Harold Nesbitt. You know what? I hate that name. That's what the (laughs) teachers call me. Call me my middle name. My name is David. End of part one. (laughs) I'll admit I don't really know where it's going from there. (laughs) There is zero chance that Scholastic and Nickelodeon would have filmed a thing where Rachel actually makes him get stuck as a rat. Although, given that it's a a trend in the series anyway, they'd probably just reassign that to Marco. Somehow he would do it. But, like, dude, in addition to them totally developing the Nonomorphs as a side-along spinoff series, this is how they were going to do the David trilogy. Uh, You know what I think? I want to write it. I think... I think this is this is the most beautiful character introduction in the world. Oh <laughs> uh, no! Write write it. Here's the thing. And you like, and you know what? And send it send it to the actor. All right, <laughs> because oh, oh my god, I'm so glad you reminded me. I'm so glad you reminded me, dude. 
So I was curious about this actor. His name is J.J. Stock. It seems like this was pretty close to the end of his acting career. Most of what he did were minor, very minor roles. But then I found some other stuff from this man by the same name. And at first I didn't believe it was the same guy until I found the picture. This man, and now I forgot which branch it was. I don't know if it was the Marines or whatever, but this man joins the Canadian military. He's an officer who's done multiple tours of duty, he's highly decorated. He went on to have a distinguished career. I don't think as an actor he ever got the shot, but like seriously, <laughs> if you want someone who could pivot from like like a kind of creepy but also fundamentally harmless to like on a dime turn into, no, he will kill you, Mr. J.J. Stalker could have done this. Man. I'm a better actor than I thought. Oh, yeah. If and when I write this, this is like the artistic vow, I will not try to make it good. <laughs> like, I will try to make it the exact quality of the show as it existed. Like, it's not going to have a narratively mm -hmm. uh, satisfying payoff. I think I probably will reassign stuff to Marco. Like, I don't want it to be better. I want it to be just more of the same since it was established that season two wasn't doing this anymore, I don't have to worry about writing in a multi-angle cut. I just have to do fake slow-mo. Because, <laughs> of course, that has to be dictated in the teleplay, right? <laughs> yes. I'll also make sure to do a, a, an unjustifiably long power walk sequence. Yeah. I've spoken. Beautiful. I want you to try to, uh, to defend the beauty in the Andalite arm fight. I remember seeing it as a kid for the first time on TV, and I also thought the actual arm fight part made sense. I was like, oh, yes, powerful, powerful aliens. Of course, this is how they would fight, right? And then as I got older and I watched it in high school, right, I was watching like a, you know, a YouTube equivalent site that had these um, horribly converted versions. And I was like, oh, wow, this, uh, this episode didn't convert correctly because everything just looks all blurry and fuzzy. Oh, right. Uh, my, my bad luck. I guess I'll never be able to see a good quality version of it. And then like, you know, I don't know how, you know, a few years ago, I get the, um, you know, the Amazon or the YouTube quality versions and I watch it and I'm just like, what the ever living hell like what 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 happened this is not what i remember what is going on here this this was an epic battle of the ages and it's just a it's it's a blurry mess where they're just kind of holding hands up above them and the tails really aren't in use and uh they're just playing with each other's arms and i was so i was so disappointed you're not so I, I looked at the scene very closely and started to kind of diagram who was where and at what time. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> I like how Mr. Three's got like a foam finger. That that will come into play later. Okay. Okay. Carry on, please. Okay, so we have the, the five controllers plus Visser 3 who are breaking down the door to the observatory. Like two and a half oh, minutes of screen time to break through that door. They get there in like less than a minute. That pacing is just absolutely amazing to me. It does look epic. I like the way the, the flashlights flip up one by one. It, it's badass. Okay. <laughs> Not not to stomp all over your moment here, but um, the shot starts off badass. You're right. It's going up the line of flashlight drake and beams, and the crosshairs are popping up one by one. Except mm -hmm. then they do a multi-angle where you don't see one come up. They like ruin it at the last minute in classic <laughs> oh, yeah. Animorphs fashion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I want to pretend like a prop malfunctioned, like the last one didn't trigger, and they're like, I'll be damned if I'm going to back this rig up and do that shot again. Okay. They successfully blow down the door, mm -hmm. and then you see them walking up the stairs. So this means they are not on the first floor anymore. Yep. And I said, that doesn't make sense because the uh, the place with all the, the balconies, the atrium area, that's, uh, that's on the first floor. Except, I think it was consistent now. So Axe, Marco, and Jake are at the top with the telescope. Okay. And then they go down the stairs and you can see in three different shots, you can see the numbers on the doors. Mm -hmm. They start out somewhere above floor two. And as they go down, they get to floor two and then to floor one, except Axe splits off from Jake and Marco. So we see Axe exiting through the door with the number two in it. So that means Axe is going to the second floor as Jake and Marco are trying to go to the first floor to exit the buildings because Axe wants to go fight Visser three. 
So then Jake and Marco have to go up to floor two. And we can see that because Axe, we see him transition uh, through the pillar, right? He morphs through the pillar, right? And then <laughs> later on... You are being entirely too casual about these amazing illustrations. And then later on, Jake and Marco are, are beside the, the same pillar. So, so they did clearly exit through door number two as well. And so now getting to, to your point about the Marco conjuring the magical people out of nowhere, I was like, mm, I don't know about that. that. That doesn't sound quite right. We can try to count the number of people that are in the balcony. It's really hard to tell because there's a lot of quick cuts, except I mm -hmm. think a lot of the shots are repeated with who's coming in when. So you have a shot of them like coming in and then a shot of them opening up their flashlights and it might have just been replicated shots to make it look like there's more people than there actually were. But I think this number is correct here. So what's that? Ten, You're looking that? at 10, ten people? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's 10 people in the balcony looking down. And maybe they want it to appear like it's going the full way around, like in a circle, but... In our head, we just assume that that pattern repeats, right? So we assume that there's mm -hmm. people similarly spaced around every level, but we have no reason to actually believe that. Honestly, I think that's just it. There's just 10 people there. And it looks like some of them might have been the people from blasting the door down. It's really hard to tell because it's so dark, but I might try to match that up later with the, the clothing that are on the people that blast it down the door. Then the scene progresses and we got Visser 3 and then he, he does his little pointy fingers, right. points with one hand and then does a two pointy uh, with the other hand. Don't know why, but he does. And he morphs, and we have our Andalite arm fight, which is just, again, the most beautiful thing in the world. Yes. It's like a beautiful dance. So then off camera, we have Jake morphing, and he becomes a tiger, and he breaks up the fight and knocks uh, Visser 3 down. Axe runs away, but then Marco comes in to help split up the controllers. Now, we established that the only controllers that showed up were the ones who blasted down the door, and some right. of them seem to appear in the balcony. They are all wearing t-shirts. Yeah. All five of them. <laughs> Dude, two of these people in the Marco shot are wearing shorts. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see how badly they were cropped, and I understand cropping in the wild animals. I mean, it looks like crap, but I understand why they did it. Why yeah. does this shot exist? Yeah, I, I, because it was it was it had to have been filmed separately, right? So they just they had some you know some kids that are like ah, just you know run run across the camera's field of view and uh, you know stand behind the screen screen when we do it. Oh my god, dude! It reminds me of the old <laughs> Area Fifty One video game that you'd see in uh, in arcades everywhere back then. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> you put Marco's orange jacket on the wall. <laughs> Oh my god, dude, the level of artistry. If nobody ever appreciates it, please know unambiguously that I appreciate this. Now, here's the thing. Let's say we, we, we look at back at it again, and we could count the number of people. You could still be able to clearly tell who's wearing the, 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 the very bland, you know, colors of browns and blacks, blues, and dark yeah. purple. But the t-shirts are white, bright, bright blue, purple, and like tan so you, you'd see them <laughs> that that's the thing they're on the wrong floor like so that was another thing i feel <laughs> like i feel like the duel has to take place on the first floor because in the background i think you see you know shots of glass doors like they'd open out to the street level mm. i mean they do say it's an observatory on koenig hill Dad and Dr. Hamley are setting up the radio telescope on Koenig Hill. I've seen that structure. It's state of the art. And I guess it's possible that the terrain is uneven enough that, like, on one side it opens up to... Wait, wait, what's, what's the name of the, the hill? First. Koenig Hill. Okay, so maybe it is a conic shape and uh, it, it's at a slant anyway. So yeah, not there conic. Are, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I googled to see if Koenig Hill is a real thing, and as best I can tell, it's not. However, I looked at the etymology for the name Koenig, and it's from the Germanic uh, for the word king. So now, un until someone can prove otherwise, it's now my headcanon that a writer knew that and uh, did it as an obscure reference to King of the Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. When you cut to this long shot of Visser 3, is that a window or is that a door? I, I thought it was a window. When, he, like, when he morphs and there's thunder out of nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it appears to be a window. 
then you know, Axe morphs and they're staring each other down and Mr. Three's tail is doing the Jack in the Box from the Twilight Zone thing. You would think this is the single shot of the entire series that I, of all people, would know <laughs> the details of. And yeah, there's a street light right out there. They're all, they filmed this on the ground floor of somewhere. But it's got to be the second floor of somewhere. This is... No, that, it just that, it, gets it, deeper. It, Every time you think you found all the mistakes or all the inconsistencies and come up with something to explain it. No, no, but this this does work. I'm I'm think I'm picturing this, you know, this observatory on a cone-shaped hill. If you have the entrance on the front side of the building, then it would be at a higher elevation the back side. Yeah, um the two malls closest to me where I grew up were both built that way. Like, depending on which entrance you went through, you'd enter on the mm-hmm. second floor sometime because the parking lot around it was actually at an angle. So, yeah, it could be that the main entrance that they've gone through on floor one, you know, that that's just like the vestibule or whatever. Floor two is a wide open area, and that's where the battle's going down. But on the other side of the building on floor two, it might just open up to the street level. I mean, you brought up a whole bunch of things that, like, I still never caught with that scene with, with all those, um, you know, background characters and, the, and the, the green screen at the end. Like, that just doesn't phase me one bit, right? Like, I, I never caught that, you know, in this free watch. I never caught it through all the times that I've seen it. And then it's like as I'm, you know, gearing up uh, to, to do an Animorphs channel after feeling invigorated from our book club, I was just like, I'm going to make this scene have some of the, the, the epic beauty I remember as a child. I'm thinking, okay, so what's what's a song that I associate with epic battles? And... In particular, epic battles with maybe something that's not particularly a good uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got it. And, oh, I feel my sense of pure joy has returned when watching this scene now. And I, and I was so glad that we got to, got to share it with the rest of our book club, where it was their first time seeing that. And uh, for one of our friends who hopped on partway through... She uh, <laughs> she missed out on on us rewatching the full episode, right? She joins at, in at the very end, and I'm like, well, if you're going to see this scene for the first time, this is the correct way to see it. <laughs> when I uh, when I watched that, when it premiered on Nickelodeon, I, uh, I just accepted it. I didn't see it as good or bad. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, th- that's how, that makes sense. It's weird. I, I obviously had no critical engagement with it whatsoever. You know, I think it was a blind spot with just things that I love. If I've decided that I love it going in, then I just gave it every benefit of the doubt, and my imagination just filled in the holes. When I was 12 and The Phantom Menace came out, dude, that was the best thing I ever saw. And, you know, I've totally gotten over that now, and, you know, completely unrelated. In uh, four days, I'm going to go see Matrix 4, and I'm sure it's going to be great. And and as you incorrectly, uh, you know, make the assumption it was just childhood nostalgia that um, that made you think the sequels were good. Uh, <laughs> that is an incorrect opinion. <laughs> and the, and uh, those sequels still hold up today. <laughs> you know um, what? I would love to do a non amorph style spinoff of Saria Rifts wherein we do Tasty Wheat and talk about the Matrix sequels. <laughs> I'm there. We can do it. You. Yes, me. Me, me, me. Me too. It doesn't look like it'll fit. What, you have a better idea? 